is Amanda Williams, and on behalf of the MacArthur Memorial and the General Douglas MacArthur Foundation, welcome to the program. Tonight, in partnership with the Hampton Roads Naval Museum, we commemorate the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor with a presentation by Walter Bornman about his latest book, Brothers Down, Pearl Harbor and the Fate of the Many Brothers Aboard the USS Arizona. Please join me in welcoming John Pentangelo, director of the Hampton Roads Naval Museum. Good evening from Norfolk, Virginia, and welcome to tonight's virtual lecture hosted by the MacArthur Memorial and the Hampton Roads Naval Museum. My name is John Pentangelo, and I'm the director of the Hampton Roads Naval Museum, an official Department of the Navy Museum administered by the Naval History and Heritage Command. Please check our website and plan your visit when you're in the area. Located at Nauticus in downtown Norfolk, the museum interprets the rich naval history of the Hampton Roads region, home to the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, the oldest naval shipyard in the nation, and also home to Naval Station Norfolk, the largest naval complex in the world. This history also includes one of the most historically significant naval battles in world history, the Battle of Hampton Roads. On March 9, 1862, when the USS Monitor clashed with the CSS Virginia, it marked the very first battle between ironclad warships. The famous Civil War naval engagement actually began the day before, when the CSS Virginia left its berth at the shipyard in Portsmouth and steamed into the roads to attack the vessels of the North Atlantic Blockading Squadron. Virtually impervious to shot and shell, Virginia rammed and sank the wooden sloop of war USS Cumberland and set the USS Congress ablaze, destroying the ship in a spectacular explosion. With over 250 casualties, many of them lying at the bottom of the water in USS Cumberland's wreck, that day was the worst defeat in the history of the United States Navy. That is, until December 7th, 1941. 80 years ago today, the Japanese launched an attack on the American naval base in Pearl Harbor, Hawaii. In addition to destroying or damaging battleships and other vessels, over 2,400 Americans were killed. The next day, President Franklin Roosevelt asked Congress for a declaration of war, and the U.S. began its long road to victory in the Pacific. The most enduring memory of the attack is probably that of the battleship USS Arizona's destruction. Similar to the fate of USS Congress, Arizona suffered a devastating explosion in one of its powder magazines. The explosion forced the battleship to the bottom of the harbor with tremendous loss of life. Our speaker this evening, historian Walter Borneman, is going to discuss how this event affected a number of families. His latest work is Brothers Down, Pearl Harbor and the Fate of Many Brothers Aboard the USS Arizona. It's a deeply personal story of the 38 sets of brothers serving on the ship and how their loved ones experienced the death and the destruction of that infamous day. Mr. Borneman is the author of nine books about American military and political history, including the bestseller, The Admirals, Nimitz, Halsey, Leahy, and King, which won the Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize for Naval Literature in 2012. And he's also the author of MacArthur at War, World War II in the Pacific, a finalist for the Gilder Lerman Prize for Military History in 2016. His commentary has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and on foxnews.com. Please join us after the talk for a live question and answer session with the author. Thank you for joining us, and please welcome Walter Borneman. Good evening. It's indeed my honor to be with you to commemorate the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. You know, as Franklin Roosevelt said, it remains 80 years after the fact, a date that indeed lives in infamy. I must say that it's one of those generational landmarks. Uh, men, women, children all remembered where they were on December 7th of 1941. And you know, later dates, it's like the Kennedy assassination or 9-11, uh, the tragedies of, of those. We all remember where we were at that particular point. And those feelings, those emotions uh, among family members in particular, which we're going to talk about tonight, are pretty powerful. And I'm, I'm gonna share with you how I was really amazed at how powerful and emotional some of the memories are of these family members 80 years after the attack on Pearl Harbor. 
Well, let me just say that I think standing on the bridge of the Missouri when I was out at Pearl Harbor writing the book, The Admirals, I was looking over the Arizona Memorial and really only vaguely aware that there were 38 sets of brothers on that ship out of a crew of, of 1,500 that included a pair of twins. It included two trios of, of three brothers serving together. And out of that complement, ship's complement of 1,500, there were 1,177 casualties from a rear admiral down to one of the newest and greenest recruits. It was a staggering toll, particularly among the 78 men on board who were brothers out of those 38 sets. Only 15 survived that attack. You know, that's an 80% casualty rate. How could that be? Only 15 brothers out of, out of the 78. Well, permit me a couple of general comments about my book, Brothers Down, and why I ch chose to tell this story, and how it's really different than, than some of the other stories uh, I've written. You know, a number of my books have focused on, on big picture topics. There have been major wars, uh, an expansionist president, controversial general, and of course, the, the four men who became five-star admirals in, in the U.S. Navy. And Yet behind all of those major characters from some of my past books were the average men, the rank and file, who quite frankly, upon their shoulders, fell the responsibility, fell the uh, determination and grit, if you will, to accomplish some of those broader goals. And I think that was particularly true, uh, we're going to learn this evening, about the men who were on the Arizona and, and the brothers uh, among them. You know, their personal goals, quite frankly, were to just live to see the next sunrise. And that, that was pretty emotional. And, and I'll, I'll read you a few stories uh, about that. The second thing I, I think I'd share that's, that's much different about this particular book than some of the other things I've done is how personally it, it affected me. Uh, there was certainly a different research path. Um, I simply was not prepared for the outpouring of photos, treasured letters, uh, family reminiscences. And, and I think two things really struck me. One was the willingness of these families that I worked with to recount and share with me what in many respects were, were very private and personal stories. And the other thing that struck me was, was that their continuing sorrow for lost family members, and except in, in rare cases, they didn't really know them personally. They were remembering um, uh, lost uncles or cousins. They were remembering stories that the siblings of those lost, in many cases, their grandparents had told. So it was, it was, uh, it, it was an emotional experience in that regard. And I think it really put a, a personal light, if you will, on what happened at Pearl Harbor 80 years ago today. Um, I have to say that some of the stories were like a granddaughter who, who would tell me, oh, what she remembered growing up was she was always told, don't play too loudly because it'll get on grandpa's nerves. You know, grand, grandpa's nerves are a little frayed. Well, that grandpa was, was one of the sets of, of brothers who, who were on the Arizona. I guess permit me as well two maybe general comments uh, before we look at some slides about the state of brothers serving together and also about the state of the country on December 7th, 1941. You know, in, in the pre-war Navy, there did not seem to be any particular uh, problem with brothers serving together on a single ship. I think you have to remember this is uh, the 1930s leading up to 1941. It's the Depression. People need jobs. So many of the people that we're going to meet and, and look at tonight really joined the Navy because they desperately needed a job. 
They needed to be able to send a paycheck or a portion of a paycheck, $36 a month starting out, back to their families. And in many cases, they were supporting younger siblings, brothers and sisters. Many of those brothers would also join, join the Navy. And in the pre-war Navy, 1930s, what better recruiting poster than uh, a big brother coming home in, in uniform, not only coming home in uniform, but also coming home and having a, a steady paycheck. That was, that was a pretty powerful motivator. So some of the brothers who joined up, some of any uh, of the people who joined the Navy, really were, were doing so in, in some respects out of patriotic pride. And there were a few in the group who were indeed rovers who signed up just to, to see the world, but a great many of them joined up because of, of those two things, a, a, a steady paycheck and uh, you know you weren't going to be laid off uh, your job un until the end of, of your enlistment. Generally, speaking about brothers, we many of us know about the story of, of the Sullivan brothers, the five of them who, who joined up. Two of them had actually been in the Navy before Pearl Harbor. The other three joined after Pearl Harbor, and they did so, a lesser known fact, they did so to avenge the death of one of their buddies, Bill Ball, who, by the way, was, was a great uh, budding baseball player. That was his passion. They came out of, of Iowa, and Bill Ball was one of the, the brothers who were, was on the Arizona that morning of, of December 7th. And the Sullivan brothers, of course, joined up again, uh, two of them and, and three new recruits, with, with the proviso that they wanted to, to serve together. They wanted to be on the same ship, and they ended up being on the cruiser Juno and very tragically uh, being lost uh, at, at Guadalcanal roughly a year af after uh, December 7th. Well, and uh, one other comment about the general state of the country in 1941. I was surprised, despite uh, what I've written in the Admirals and, and the MacArthur book, a lot about the run-up to December 7th, I was surprised at the level in the letters of these young men going to their mothers, fathers, sweethearts, back and forth, how they really expected something major to happen in the Pacific. Now, we know that in July of 1941, the United States, along with Great Britain and the Netherlands, imposed an oil embargo on Japan. Uh, Doug Douglas MacArthur is recalled to active duty uh, in the Philippines. Uh, there are things, of course, in the Atlantic going on in terms of, of skirmishes with, with German U-boats, but there is an expectation in the Pacific that something is going to happen. Japan is going to flex its muscles and probably complete extending down some of their uh, aggression toward uh, the Dutch East Indies, maybe the American uh, territory of, of the Philippines. So I think that there is, is a definite um, undercurrent, if you will, in the fleet, which has been posted to uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, on December 7th of 1941, about half of the American Pacific Fleet is actually in port at that particular time. Let me just read to you what one of our brothers, if you will, writes home to his girlfriend. Bud Height says, when I get my next leave, he's writing to Donna, and we're back together, let's not waste a minute of it because it may be the last time we get together. Now, maybe he shouldn't have said that, Bud continued, but you know, he told Donna, as well as I do, that we may be at war any day now. It will be hard for those we love and those that love us. All my love, Bud. Well, of course, Bud Height was among the casualties on December 7th, uh, 1941. But I think that there's, there's indeed an expectation among the rank and file in the fleet that something's going to happen. Let's go ahead and take a look at um, some slides. And I want to tell you a little bit about that particular day. But mostly I want to talk about that day through the impact of 
the brothers. This is the USS Arizona underway in the 1930s off Diamond Head. The Arizona built in 1915, 608 feet in length. It's got four turrets of three massive 14 inch guns. There's a young lady named Esther Ross, who's actually from Prescott, Arizona. She's 18 at the time and she christens the Arizona. They don't give her a lot of time to speak, but she does go ahead and say a few words saying that she has christened the largest battleship in the world, which at that particular point it was, and it was named after, in Esther's words, the greatest state in, in the Union. That happens in 1915. There's an initial crew of 1,000, but by the time of Pearl Harbor, there are 1,500 men, give or take a little bit as they move uh, on and off, who are assigned to the ship. Again, the, the staggering number is that out of those uh, uh, 1,500, there are 1,177 casualties. Now, on the morning of December 7th, 1941, there are eight of these battleships in port. And we're going to talk about those in detail. But I want you to meet the Becker family. The Beckers are from Kansas, and this is the mid-1930s. Look at that back row, Wesley, Harvey, Walter, and Marvin. Now, Walter is the oldest, even though uh, Harvey there's got a couple of inches on him, and he is going to become the family farmer. Uh, Bill, uh, the, the, the family uh, patriarch, has been a farmer in Kansas. Uh, Mother Frida trying to eke out a living, living again, in, in these Depression-era days. And it's tough. Walter's going to end up with the family farm, doing the family farming. What's Harvey going to do? Well, he needs a job. So he joins the Navy. And in very short order, um, Wesley and Marvin, as they come of age, do the same thing. Now, take a look at Bob seated in the lower right. By Pearl Harbor, he's too young to be in a position of uh, joining up, but he will join up because of these three, two of, of that trio of Becker family uh, brothers do not survive the attack. And Bob Becker, whose children um, I got to know very well through this project and who were with me at, at some presentations, uh, I think the operative words from young Bob there is that he joined up when he became of age because, quote, it was just something he absolutely had to do. He had to avenge his brother's deaths. Well, let's move forward to the morning of December 7th. This photo was actually taken over Thanksgiving weekend of 1941. Harvey, these boys have grown up, as you can see, Harvey's now married. So he gets to stand, uh, stay uh, ashore, particularly on weekends, as long as the Arizona is in port uh, with his wife. And frequently, Wesley and Marvin would be, would be invited over. Wesley's kind of the one who's the artist in the family, okay? And Marvin's kind of uh, quiet and shy. Another story that was told about Marvin is that he was kind of a, a food aficionado, or at least someone who um, liked food and was always willing to save it. There's family stories told that Wesley would take uh, a hot dog, he'd eat half of it, he put the other half in his pocket so that he could savor that later. But this is Thanksgiving just before um, that final week of December leading up to the early morning attack, and those are the three uh, Becker brothers in, in Pearl Harbor. We'll meet the Murdoch family and, and take a look at um, uh, Charles Wesley's feet there in terms of boots. Yes, they're in their dressed up uh, Sunday go to meeting clothes and they're sitting there for the family portrait. But this is the, the, the red dirt hills of Alabama. It's the 1930s. Again, the underlying story is, is one of poverty. And of these pictures, uh, Thomas in the upper left there is the first to leave home and join the Navy. And shortly thereafter, Melvin and Charles Luther, who actually was always called uh, Luther, uh, are going to follow him. Now, keep an eye on Melvin because this next photo is rather interesting. 
There he is, 1941, Long Beach. Uh, one of the last times that the Arizona had a port call at, at Long Beach. And Melvin's gone off and bought a 1940 Chevrolet Coupe. And there's a family story that what happened to that car after the attack on Pearl Harbor? The Arizona went out of Long Beach. Uh, the three Murdoch brothers were on board and Melvin put the car in storage in Long Beach. But at least according to family stories, no one ever saw it again, at least no, none, of, none of the family members. Now, Thomas at that particular point, just like the elder uh, Becker brother, was also married and had a wife at Pearl Harbor. So Luther was supposed to uh, eat dinner uh, with Thomas on Saturday night, December 6th, which he did. And he wanted to join, Melvin had been invited, but Melvin said, no, I, I, I've got stuff to do and I'm, I'm, I'm packing, uh, et cetera. Um, so it ended up that Luther came back to the ship because he wanted to spend the evening and with Melvin and, and see what was going on after dinner with uh, older, older brother Thomas. So the oldest Murdoch brother is indeed on shore on the morning of December 7th, but his two brothers, Melvin and Luther, are not. Let's take a look then what happens when the bombs start to fall on the morning of December 7th, 1941. The initial attack with um, uh, some Japanese Zeros and uh, dive bombers begins, and then the Kate bombers come in both from the west and from the east here with uh, torpedoes. And they're basically carrying huge torpedoes that are armed with armor-piercing bombs. And they're going to go ahead and attack Battleship Row here. And you can see the California, you can see the Maryland, Oklahoma, Tennessee, West Virginia, Arizona, and Nevada. Why are they staged like that? Well, we get, again, remember that we've talked about there's an expectation that something's going to happen somewhere relatively soon. And I think Admiral Kimmel left the battleships there in part because he wanted to be prepared to sortie as a fleet and counter any uh, Japanese aggression that might happen against the Philippines. Notice even in this map that the, the bows of the ships are pointed down toward the opening of, of the harbor. Well, the torpedoes are unleashed against the ships, and you can see in this photograph one of the earliest explosions of the torpedoes that come in from the right here and strike the West Virginia and the Oklahoma that are lying outboard, if you will, from Fort Island. This is Fort Island, the next two battleships in line, West Virginia and um, Tennessee, and the Arizona's here. We'll talk about the ship that's moored next to Arizona in a second, uh, Nevada in, in the background. So the next photo will actually spin this around and show the view of torpedoes coming in and beginning to strike the ships that are outbound. Notice that the torpedo part of the attack it really can't reach the inboard uh, battleships, um, Tennessee, Maryland, and here's the Arizona sitting here. Look at the oil slick that already is coming out of California oil slicks that are already coming out of, of West Virginia and, and Oklahoma as those torpedoes um, have struck. So the attack continues. Let's talk about the Shive brothers. You know, the Shive brothers and their best buddy, Weston, and he actually spelled his name W-E-S-S, -S, Weston Balfour had grown up in Laguna Beach together. The Shive's dad had died in the 1930s uh, early. Their mom remarried again, really, I think, out of economic necessity. The new stepfather uh, butted heads with, with these two uh, rambunctious teenage boys. Gordon escaped first and noticed that he joined the Marines. Uh, there was a Marine detachment of roughly about 90 men assigned to the battleship Arizona. That's what happened in terms of capital ships throughout the fleet. 
uh, during those days. Marines uh, did a number of things from running out errands for the admirals, uh, providing security for the ship, and of course, when, when combat came, certainly manning their battle stations to defend the ship. So in this picture, Gordon escapes first. He joins the Marines. I think he took out some of his frustrations uh, by becoming uh, part of the Marine uh, rowing team, the whaleboat rowing team aboard the Arizona. Up here at Malcolm, he was kind of shy. I, I, I don't mean to tell stories about his um, uh, report card in high school, but let's just say his uh, best class and the one he managed to get the highest grade in, which was only a D plus, was auto shop. So Malcolm really needed to do something different, and he found it in the Navy. He became a radio man, um, very engaged, and it was just wonderful for uh, the two shy brothers to be serving together on the Arizona. This is uh, Ed Brom. He's a member of the Marine Detachment along with Gordon. And then down here is, is indeed um, West Balfour, uh, their buddy from Laguna. So I wanna read you, and again, in terms of um, stories and letters, in this digital age, I think there are probably some folks watching this that don't remember what it was like, as I do, to uh, to write letters and write letters back and forth to uh, girlfriends and, and have there be some miscommunication uh, a along the way. And that's exactly what happened between Gordon and his girlfriend, Marge, who by no little coincidence happened to be Wes's sister. So. Gordon writes to Marge in November of 1941. What's the matter? Gordon had asked Marge at the start of a letter written on November 2nd, 1941. Then he got to the heart of the matter. I have heard, maybe from Wes, I have heard that you and Harry had ideas of getting hitched. Well, if you do, I hope you will be happy. Now, those magnanimous words aside, Gordon crossed out a couple of words and then added, no, that isn't cursing, it's just a misprint. Well, Marge's response, which of course has gone missing, must have been a little bit uh, encouraging or more than a little bit encouraging to Gordon because um, it set him straight. Doggone, was I glad to hear from you, Gordon wrote back to Marge. I thought you were on the outs, but I see that I was badly mistaken. Calling himself a dope for doubting and promising not to get, quote, any more of those silly ideas, Gordon confessed that this was the second letter that he had written to Marge in response, but that he couldn't bring it to mail himself, uh, mail it himself. He wanted to deliver it to Marge in person. So we'll keep it, he wrote, till I see you again. If nothing doesn't happen, but if something should happen, you will get it in the mail. It will be dated November 20th, 1941. Well, of course, the letter never arrived. Uh, I must tell you, with, with Gordon dead, um, Marge later indeed married Harry. Now, this photograph is on the back side of this postcard. Look at the postmark, USS Arizona, November 12th. Dear Mom, this is from Gordon to his mom in Laguna Beach. Look who is all here. How's that for a reunion? Wes, spelled with that second S, has left for squiggly line. Hmm. So I don't know when I will be able to see him again. Letter following. Well, of course, Gordon couldn't put in if indeed he even knew where he was going because it would never have gotten past the censors. But Wes ends up going out to the Philippines uh, and actually ending up uh, arming uh, P-40s, uh, part of Douglas MacArthur's Air Force. Uh, he's captured in the Battle of Bataan. He is sent to a prison camp at Davao on Mindanao. And in one of the great tragedies of MacArthur's advance to retake the Philippines, Wes is on a, a POW ship as the Japanese tried to evacuate their, some prisoners of war out of the Philippines. And unbeknownst to an American submarine that this is indeed a, a ship carrying uh, American POWs, um, Wes is lost on, on that. 
particular uh, tragedy. So the carefree lads of Laguna um, are, are all killed. The, the, the two shy brothers on December 7th and Wes after enduring uh, four years of hell in a, in a POW camp. Ed Brom, by the way, the, the, the final person in, in that particular photo goes on and um, survives the war. You know, there was also um, a, a father and son uh, group on the Arizona, Thomas Augusta Free, and he always went by the nickname Gussie, and his son William. Gussie had joined the Navy in, in World War I, and he'd come home, uh, married, uh, he had William, and tried to make things work, and it just didn't seem to work in uh, a farmland in Texas. So Gussie rejoined, re-upped, and put in 20 years with the Navy. And by the time William came of age, uh, 18 in 1941, Gussie was all too glad to, to have him join the, the, the um, compliment on, on the um, Arizona. Now, Gussie that night, I was never able to figure out what ailed him on the night of December 6th, 1941, but he's in sick bay, which is actually a uh, forward on the Arizona toward the bow. And William uh, takes the night and has dinner with some, they were kind of, um, oh, relatives, but uh, distant relatives on, uh, Honolulu at Honolulu. And of course, like so many, they say, well, why don't you spend the night? No, no, William's going to go back to the ship to check on his dad, which indeed he did do. So of course, he also is there the next morning. Carl Buddy Christensen, two brothers from Kansas. Carl is the last brother there would have been uh, 37 sets had he not reported on, and he is the last brother to join the Arizona's crew. That happens toward the end of October of, of 1941. It's kind of interesting, um, you know, Carl goes by the nickname Buddy, and his uh, brother, whose name was Edward, went by the nickname of Sonny, and Sonny Christensen is the older brother. He's a baker. On, on the Arizona. And um, on the morning of December 7th, uh, Buddy has only been on the ship of a, a few weeks. Arizona's been at sea through some of, of that time. So what do they want to do? They want to go into Honolulu together and take a photograph of both of them in uniform for their mom to send back for Christmas uh, in Kansas. Well, they met on, on the deck and um, Buddy, uh, probably his younger brothers uh, would do, uh, pointed out to Sonny that, hey, you have a, you have a blemish on, on your hat. Um, that certainly won't do. So Sonny went back uh, below decks to uh, retrieve a different hat, and that was the last time Buddy ever saw him. Uh, the attack came. Buddy ran to his battle station, which was in turret four, toward the aft uh, end of the ship, and Sonny, having disappeared uh, looking for a replacement hat below decks, was never seen again. Well, here's the developing story of, of what's happening. Look along Battleship Row. The oil slicks are increasing. They're starting to spread out. The Oklahoma is beginning, you can even see it from this photograph, it's beginning to list to port, and it's basically going to roll over, trapping uh, a number of, of sailors. Next in line, the West Virginia, having been torpedoed in much the same way, is really about to suffer a similar fate, except that its executive officer very um, promptly and shrewdly orders a counter-flooding measure. So water is uh, put into the ship, it basically rights itself and settles in the mud on the bottom and doesn't do the role that the uh, Oklahoma is going to do. Well, back here we have the Arizona. It's still been pretty well protected. You don't see it's taken any torpedo hits. This ship that's outboard of it from Fort Island is a repair ship. It's the Vestal. 
And the Vestal is alongside the Arizona because that particular uh, weekend and this particular stint with the Arizona being in port, there were a number of things that were uh, going to be done, in, including some housing for radar that was going to be installed. So that's why the Vestal, think of the Vestal as kind of the hardware store of the Pacific fleet. And they've got all kinds of uh, tools and shops and everything else to, to do things. Now aboard the Vestal are, or at least one, Joe Giovanazzo, gentleman on the left. His brother, Mike, on the right, is on the Arizona. Or excuse, yes, it's on the Arizona. So Joe is on the Vestal, and he has been on the crew of, of the Arizona before. So these two brothers have been together. But more recently, Joe has been assigned to the Vestal. And since he, too, uh, is married and has a, a wife in Honolulu, he likes that a lot better as far as a duty station because he gets to spend more, more time ashore. The Vestal doesn't deploy and go out for maneuvers like, like the battleships. Well, look at that grin. I don't know who the, the middle person person is, the family, the Giovanasso family uh, doesn't know that either, but this was clearly taken sometime probably in November of 1941. Look at that smile on Mike's face on the right. He too, as so many people in, in those years were, was a great up-and-coming ball player. Uh, he loved um, to play ball. They were from um, Silvis, uh, Illinois and had grown up there on, on the baseball diamonds. He is about ready to be done with his stint in the Navy. He's um, due to go home and be discharged. The family was always never quite willing to have me say point blank that he was going to be engaged to be married, but the evidence suggests that. And, and a young man uh, coming out of the Navy, uh, having saved some dollars in, in those days, it was probably uh, a, a sure thing that, that, that he, he was going to, to at least become engaged and, and due to be married. Well, Mike, unfortunately, is, is on the Arizona that morning. Uh, Joe is not on the Vestal. He's in Honolulu. But what happens in, in terms of, of the tragedy is, of course, um, Giovanazzo is not that common a name. Uh, it takes Joe a few days to notify his parents back in Illinois that he's safe. What about Mike? Nobody knows. Um, finally, there's a notification that Mike is missing. It's terrible. Days creep by. It's Christmas Eve. The Giovanazzo family receives a telegram that says, Mike's alive. And one of uh, his younger siblings who was still able to talk to family members just remembers she was only five at the time, but she remembers the joy that was in that Christmas Eve uh, household that Mike was alive. Well, very tragically, of course, it had been a mistake. Uh, the Navy notified, thinking uh, they were notifying a Giovanazzo about Joe, uh, got confused with the records, notified that Mike was okay. okay. Um, family waited a few weeks because he was due to come home on leave. They realized everything would be uh, kind of messed up and, and delayed and didn't really worry too much until finally early in January, they got the dreaded news that, that Mike had been among those killed on the Arizona. Well, in those clouds right there is this horrendous blast that comes not from torpedoes, but it comes from um, the high altitude bombers that basically fly right down Battleship Row. And while the outboard, um, battleships have suffered torpedo damage, the bombs that fall, and these, these are big armor-piercing um, uh, naval shells that are, are meant to go through the four-inch decking of, of these battleships and then uh, wait just a, a second or so and explode. One of those bombs drops right through basically turret number two area on the, the forward of the mask on the, uh, mast on the Arizona. Now, this ship back here that hasn't been hit much yet is the battleship Nevada. It's the only battleship of the eight that are in Pearl Harbor that day that's actually going to get underway by the time of, of the second wave of, of the attack. Well, back to 
Donna and Ed um, Bud uh, Height. There's a story here that uh, they were secretly engaged. And again, the family was never absolutely sure, but it was said uh, that Bud had a ring uh, for Donna the next time that he was home and couldn't wait to get it to her. Now, Bud's brother, Wesley, and they had grown up in California together. Wesley was, was also aboard and both Wes and Bud were killed. And Wesley had recently assured their mother in a letter, again, written early November of 1941, I am safer on this battle boat than I would be driving back and forth to work. Well, unfortunately, when, when the bombs rained down, that wasn't the case. This is the result of the bomb striking the forward part of the Arizona. It basically lifted the ship up into the air and when it came back down, the decks pancaked together and trapped um, hundreds. And in, indeed, you know the figure we've just mentioned, a total of 1,177 men. Uh, Ed Brom, uh, the Marine, is kind of bl um, blown off. His, his position has been uh, up in the mast. And he's kind of blown off and is able to climb down and, and he survives. But almost no one that I'm aware of, unless they were blown off the ship very early on, survived in, in the forward part of the Arizona. These are the fire hoses over here on the, the Tennessee, which basically are just trying to keep all of this inferno away from, from the Arizona. So the second wave of Japanese attackers come in. The Nevada is trying to get uh, out to port, uh, out of port and to the open ocean. Uh, they don't make it. It ends up beaching across from um, Hospital Point because all of the, many of the bombers, at least of, of the second wave, end up queuing on, on the Nevada. And uh, there's, there's expectation that there's going to be a third attack. And as the boats here look for survivors, this is the flag on the left flying from the stern of, of, the, of West Virginia. And you can see that West Virginia, rather than rolling over, has just basically settled, not much freeboard there, settled into the mud, but at least it's settled uh, up, upright. And there, I think there's an expectation and a worry for much of, of that particular day throughout that Sunday that there's going to be a, another attack. Um, as horrific as this is, and as long as this will be ingrained in the American psyche, the man who Franklin Roosevelt and Ernest J. King tap to really go out to Pearl Harbor and turn this around is Chester W. Nimitz. He flies into Pearl Harbor on the morning of Christmas Day, 1941. Uh, his Coronado big four engine amphib plane is, is met with fighters to be escorted in because, you know, everyone is still very jittery at this particular point. And Nimitz recognizes three things that become important to this particular day. One, he realizes that the aircraft carriers that we've really not talked about have not been in port. And they've not been in port because um, Bill Halsey and the Enterprise is delivering Marine planes to reinforce Wake. Uh, the Lexington has been dispatched with a similar mission to Midway. And the third carrier that's it's in the Pacific, the American Navy only has three carriers in the Pacific, Saratoga's on the West Coast. Uh, loading up planes. So Nimitz recognizes that there's going to be a significant amount of air war associated with the coming struggle. And it's a good thing that the carriers aren't there. Second thing is, is that the submarine base has not been hit. And even though the American submarine force is going to have its problems with Mark VI torpedoes in the first year or two of the war, at least those submarines survived. But maybe, um, well, the carriers are important, but at, at least as important as the carriers, the, the um, the yards, the repair facilities, the uh, oil storage tanks, and the dry docks are all not hit. And you fast forward six months and know the story of the Yorktown limping into Pearl Harbor. 
as the surviving carrier of the Battle of Coral Sea and being turned around literally in hours to go out and participate in the Battle of Midway, you know, think what would have happened if, if those dry dock facilities had um, not been uh, spared during that, that attack. So standing on the bridge of the Missouri, looking out across the Arizona Memorial, um, very, very emotional place. And I guess I would have to say as emotional as this place is, and the names of all of the lost are on the memorial walls there, the, the white building with, with the flag. And of course you can go down there and, and read the, uh, the repetition of surnames as, as you go down and, and read about the brothers. And I, I guess I should mention here that there are a number of survivors who have chosen to be interred um, when their time came at this particular uh, memorial. As emotional as this is, even more so, I found the quiet of the National Memorial Cemetery of the Pacific uh, to be really, really moving. The courts of honor that are here, again, lists all of the, the brothers. Uh, they list all of the, the missing, both from World War II and Korea, but Vietnam as well. The quote, the solemn pride that must be yours, uh, is from Abraham Lincoln. And it continues, uh, to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. So this is the cemetery at frequently called the Punch Bowl, which, which is a very special place. Well, let me just conclude with, with maybe a couple more stories. You know, all of us who have, have written books frequently are, um, uh, perhaps I wouldn't say accosted, but are, are, are grilled. Uh, well, how could you leave this out? Or how come you didn't know this? And sometimes it's it's kind of an interesting story of, of how that happens. In, in my little town in uh, Colorado, uh, within a few months after Brothers Down book came out, uh, a woman uh, came up to me and said, well, one of my distant relatives, the Conan camps, were on the Arizona at, at Pearl Harbor, but you didn't mention the Conan camps as one of the brothers. So I'm, I'm like, Conan camps, um, you know, how, how did I miss that? They would have been the, the 39th pair of brothers. Um, so I began to do some research, and I had used the muster record uh, from November 30 of 1941. And it, actually what happened, there were big quarterly muster records and they were updated um, monthly. And of course, if uh, I hadn't used it of that late date, uh, Buddy Christensen wouldn't be on the list because uh, he showed up uh, relatively uh, late in the process. Well, the Conan Camp brothers from Seattle, Clarence and Emil, um, good Norwegians and good Norwegian name, Emil had been on the Arizona until November 11th of 1941. So he and Clarence had been there together, but, uh, but Emil uh, transfers off and Clarence remains. And even the Navy at that point kind of lost track of where Emil was because he was in transit. So the Conan Camp parents got missing in action letters and then killed in action letters for both of their sons. And of course it turned out when everything was sorted out that Emil was in fact alive and had been in transfer, in transfer uh, at, back to the uh, East Coast. But Clarence, his brother, is um, one of the casualties on the Arizona. I'll tell you one more story um, about the Morse brothers. The Morse brothers, Francis and Norman, grew up um, not too far from my home base in Colorado, a little place called Lamar in the southeastern part of the state. Their father had been um, in the military, seen service actually in the Spanish-American War, and some uh, he'd gotten a deferment in the First World War because he was a manager of an agricultural farm. Well, tragically, he dies in the late 20s in a farming accident, and their mother, Francis and Norman's mother, who's Clara May Morse, takes the boys to Denver. 
and there are no other siblings and she has no other real family so she basically becomes the 1930s version if you will of a helicopter mom uh everything that she's involved with uh rests with with these boys but again it's the 1930s where are they going to get a job francis delivers papers for the denver post for a bit but then very quickly uh he's been in in rotc he decides to join the navy so he does so uh, he gets posted to the west coast his younger brother norman uh does the same uh and they end up together on the arizona when the arizona comes into port at long beach for his its last uh, stateside uh port of call of course, uh, Clara uh, May goes out to Long Beach and has a great reunion with her two sons. This is June of, of 1941. It's going to be the last time that, that she sees them. Uh, she actually decides to stay, as many Navy moms and sweethearts did, in the Long Beach area. She rooms with another Navy mom with just the hope and the expectation that she's going to be able to, to see her two sons the, the next time the, the Arizona's in, in port. And, you know, I think all of these families have a similar story about packages that are returned to them or letters that are returned to them after December 7th. In uh, May Morse's case, it's two boxes, Christmas presents that she's mailed and sent to the boys, and they are returned to her marked unclaimed, undeliverable, and it takes a few more months, but she finally receives notice that there's no hope and that both Francis and Norman are among the 1177 casualties on the Arizona. Well, permit me to, to finish with just a couple of uh, paragraphs about Clara's experience and how this impacted her life. And it really brings me back to what I mentioned in the very beginning in terms of how emotional it was for me to realize that so many of these families are still grieving today for lost relatives that they did not know personally. Clara Mae Morse went on to work in a number of Denver hospitals and do extensive volunteer work. In the end, she was drawn back to the West Coast, where she had last seen Francis and Norma. She died in San Diego on November 6, 1981, a month shy of 40 years after she had lost them. Her body was taken back to Lamar, Colorado to lie beside her husband. Between them, there is another marker over an empty plot. In an oval at its top, there is a raised silhouette of a ship and the words Battleship Arizona, USN, Pearl Harbor, 1941. Beneath this oval are the names of Francis Jerome Morse and Norman Roy Morse, their birth dates, their final rates, and the date of their deaths, December 7th. 1941. Thank God for the volunteer work and all the work May wrote on the 13th anniversary of Pearl Harbor. It is a wonderful thing for me to be able to do Red Cross work after Pearl Harbor, my Pearl Harbor. Others will have their Pearl Harbors. I feel for them very much because I know God, how I do know. Well, all aboard the Arizona were figurative brothers in arms, but 87 of them were blood brothers as well. And on this 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor, we honor those men on the Arizona to be sure but we also honor all the men and women who have ever worn the uniform of our country and thank them, thank them very much from a grateful nation.
Well, thank you very much, Walt, for that wonderful presentation. Um, you know, I can't think of a better way to commemorate the 80th, 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor than by hearing about the experiences uh, of that day and um, also of the families who endured that loss. I mean, you know, all history really is about people. So to bring those events down to that level uh, really, I think, is the most meaningful thing we can do to recognize it. Uh, I would like to thank Amanda Williams and the staff at the MacArthur Memorial for helping to uh, put this together, as well as Laura Orr and the staff of the Hansman Roads Naval Museum. Um, and to all of you, thank you to everyone who has joined us today. And I do believe we have some questions, and I'm going to start uh, by asking uh, Mr. Borneman some of those. And if you have any more while we're asking, uh, please do type them in the question and answer uh, field, and we'll see if we can get to them. So, uh, Walt, one of our um, one of our audience members says 39 sets of brothers on one ship seems really high. Was this normal on all ships at the time? And how does it compare to brothers or siblings serving on say a carrier today? Well, I think it actually, John, was fairly normal in, in those times. There were, believe it or not, I think the number is seven of Patton brothers who were on the uh, Nevada. And um, out of a crew of that many, roughly 1,500 on, on capital ships like that, it, it wasn't that unusual. Now, you know, many people think that the Navy, af after the Sullivan brothers' disaster, went ahead and forbid brothers serving together. They never absolutely did that, but they certainly d discouraged it. Um, and they never went in and absolutely said, you, you can't serve together. So after the, the war, that practice, not nearly in, as it was then, but that practice continued. Great. Um, one audience member actually asks, are any of the men, I assume the brothers, uh, still alive today? None of the brothers are still alive. There are two men from the Arizona's crew, a man named Lou Conter and a man named Ken Potts, who were on the ship that day that are still alive, who recently have just turned uh, 100. Thank you. Uh, another uh, audience member asks, how many sets of brothers survived and did any sets survive? Well, wait a minute, how many brothers survived and then how many, did any sets survive, I think is the reason. Sometimes it's hard to keep the numbers straight, <laughs> even for me, but there, there were actually 15 brothers who yeah. survived. The only set of brothers that survived intact were the Warner brothers, but that's because one, Russ, was on the ship. He was very badly uh, injured. In fact, he's the man whose granddaughter told me uh, being remembered being told to, to be careful because of grandpa's nerves. His brother Ken also survived, but only because he was on detached duty at that point and was not on the Arizona, but was actually on, on the West Coast under going some additional training. Uh, one guest asks, how is researching this book different from your approach to working on other books that you've written? This was a different book, as I mentioned, uh, in terms of dealing with family members. Uh, you know, one might expect that I, I traveled around the, the country a lot, but even, and this was even before uh, COVID and, and the pandemic. But what I found is that I, so many of these families, their descendants, the cousins, uh, and in some cases, uh, grandkids, were pretty well spread out. And one of the, the most enjoyable things that I was able to do in terms of research was get them together via either Skype or Zoom or telephone conferences and be able to talk to extended family members who are all over the country. And, you know, quite frankly, some of these folks, particularly at the level of the cousins, hadn't been in touch with one another for years. So it was interesting, not mm. only for me to see those family ties being reconnected, but also it kind of uh, brought up 
well, you know, I remember when Aunt Margaret said this, or do you remember being told as a kid that? So it was, uh, it was interesting uh, for me to be able to flesh out a little bit more information. And I think it was interesting for the families to, to rekindle uh, family ties. So I actually have a follow-up question. Were there any revelations to the fan that the families didn't know that you discovered? Oh, that's that is an interesting question, and I'm I'm drawing a a specific blank, but I but I can tell you that a number of families, including the descendants of of the Murdochs, whose photo that we we saw, um, were interested in hearing some of the stories, like that the fact that the, where, what happened with Melvin's car, that, that they had never heard that story. It came from from others in in the family. So those kind of things. Uh, definitely occurred. Um, another question that a guest has was, did the Navy formally recognize that there were these brothers during the war, or was this something that came out uh, years later? Oh, if I understand the question, no, the Navy definitely recognized it and in fact, uh, encourage brothers serving together. I mentioned the point about a uh, brother coming home being a great recruiting poster, coming home in, in uniform and, and having a job, steady paycheck. I think the Navy went out of its way in the pre-war era to assign brothers, younger brothers, to ships with their older brothers. It didn't always happen, especially as brothers got up in, in the rates and, and got a little bit more uh, responsibility and specialty, but certainly uh, battleships and other capital ships were always looking for able-bodied seamen recruits, and it was usually pretty easy for the Navy to, to place them with an older brother. By the way, I, you know, I, I would just say that, of course, this is before the draft, but the fact that the Navy is still relatively small, it's only about 110,000. So just because you wanted to be in the Navy didn't necessarily mean that you were going to get in. Uh, there were only roughly, depending on the year, 10, 15, 20% who uh, and tried to enlist who were actually accepted. This is all, of course, pre-1941. Pre pre um, so shifting away from the uh, family aspect, um, one guest asked, whoop, I little, kind of lost the question. Oh, do you believe the U.S. Navy was negligent regarding the placement of battleships near Fort Island in December 1941, especially in light of the 1940 Battle of Toronto? Well, that's a question that comes up quite a bit, of course. And I guess we could certainly say with hindsight that there might have been some negligence, but I, I would say two things. One, I mentioned that only half the Pacific fleet was there. Mm -hmm. And I think Admiral Kimmel was really trying to marshal his battleships, if you will, because he was expecting at some point to probably receive orders to sail west probably to the relief of the Philippines, possibly to the relief of, of Wake or Midway, and he wanted to keep his battleships intact. The carriers, of course, it just sort of begs the question, the second point, why weren't battleships deployed with the carriers that were sent out to Wake and Midway? Well, the carriers were actually not twice as fast, but almost faster than, than the battleships, which kind of points out the, the emerging uh, technology of, of aircraft carriers and, and air power. So I, I think the bottom line is that while in retrospect, we could say perhaps they shouldn't been anchored close together like that, Kimmel thought he was doing the right thing. And under the plan orange war documents that were in place at that point, his role would have been to sail west and relieve the Philippines or wherever else the Japanese happened to attack. Thank you. Um, I think we have one more question and it's an interesting one from um, Gary Shive, who is a relative of Gordon, who is of course uh, featured in your book. And he acknowledges that uh, Gordon had mentioned in one of his letters that he movie tone news was on the ship filming in the Hawaiian Islands. 
and he has been searching for this uh, film and is wondering if you are aware that any of this footage on the Arizona still exists. Oh, Gary, it's good to have you join us. And maybe by by asking that question of the broader group, we might get some leads. But I, I have not discovered anything else since you and I uh, discussed that. And, and I guess the other thing I'd say, Gary, is that th thank you to you and your family. And again, honored that, that you would join me tonight in this. Um, it, it was your family story is, is, is one of the most gripping, especially with, with Wes uh, Balfour there. And, um, and, you know, I simply appreciate your, your support and friendship in, in, in moving this project forward. We do thank you and thank you to all our guests and to you, Walt. This has been a wonderful uh, evening and an amazing subject. If anyone has not read the book, um, it is incredible and, a, and it's, and it's a, actually a page turner before you even get to December 7th. Uh, you would think that there will be some kind of slow buildup, but it's, it really is a phenomenal piece of work um, and especially very germane. Uh, during the holidays, when we're thinking about families, to understand what families went through uh, during the worst of times. So thank you to everyone in attendance tonight. Thank you, Walter Borneman, and I hope that everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you, John. Thank you.